Hello and welcome to tonight's book reading session of Preparing for the Day After, a picture e-book. Preparing for the Day After is a photojournalistic treatise on disaster mitigation published by me, Malini Shankar and Walter Keller for the 10th anniversary of the Asian tsunami. Tonight, we will start with a chapter on the impact of bio shields on disaster risk reduction. Chapter 20. But let us first recap what we have learned in the previous book reading session before we start tonight's session. Water and sanitation is central to developmental discourse. Culture-sensitive food security also has evolved out of local agrometeorological conditions prevalent in an area. Livelihoods based on local agrometeorological conditions are the best means of ensuring livelihood security. Climate change adaptation, menstrual hygiene, especially for indigenous women, solid waste management, universal healthcare access, sustainable development goals, they are all factors to be included in the development agenda. Media personnel have to be trained in reporting disaster preparedness or the lack of it at district level. Disaster is the impact of a calamity on the human landscape. This includes the impact on lives, livelihoods, livestock and landscape. Tonight, we will start with the chapter on the role of bioshields in disaster mitigation. Bioshields are an indispensable tool in disaster risk reduction, declares Professor M. S. Swaminathan, acclaimed father of the Green Revolution, former Rajya Sabha member, that is the Upper House of Indian Parliament, member and founder chairman and the chief mentor of M. S. Swaminathan Research Foundation, UNESCO Chair in Eco-Technology. His declaration bears all the authority that courage of conviction brings to a scientist who has dedicated his scientific foresight for the benefit of humanity. Bioshields is a concept that encapsulates collectively biotic defenses against the wrath of Mother Nature. Hydrometeorological disasters include avalanches, blizzards, cloudbursts, coastal incursions, cyclones, droughts, desertification, El Nino Southern Oscillation, Floods, Flash Flood, Famine, Forest Fires, Fog, Landslides, Mudslides, Storm, Storm Surges and the Tsunami which is a hydrogeological disaster. These bio shields may include mangrove or littoral forests, coral reefs under sea, sea grass in coastal areas and endemic forest cover that occur naturally in a given biome. The native biotic matter is inherently capable of mitigating the weather related threats to the ecosystem. In late January 2005, about a month after the Asian tsunami, it emerged that mangrove laced coastal areas of the Indian state of Tamil Nadu were largely spared the lashing of the tsunami whereas those areas where the mangroves had been decimated to make way for development aka construction and human development were pounded by the tsunami quote mangrove forests which remained have protected people and their property from this huge tsunami whereas areas where the mangroves have been cleared for unsustainable development have shown huge losses of life and damage to property, unquote, says Alfredo Quato, executive director of the Mangrove Action Project in Port Angeles, Washington, USA, in the report called Tourism, Local Communities and Ecology, which is also called Tsunami Reader 1. Quote, evidence quickly emerged that indicated more severe impacts from the tsunami in areas that had seen more severe degradation of natural ecosystems and resources, as well as in societies under strain, says the IUCN's final report on the Asian tsunami, the link of which is going to be put up here as well as in the description box below. Substantiating this critical discovery is Dr. V. Selvam, former director, Coastal Ecosystems Research, M. S. Swaminathan Research Foundation in Chennai. I quote him, the role of mangroves in mitigating the impact of tsunami was studied in two villages in the Pichavaram region of coastal Tamil Nadu in India. One village called T.S. Pettai has still got mangroves forest in between the sea and the village and another village Murukutturai is directly exposed to the sea due to absence of mangrove. Both the villages are located more or less at the same distance from the sea and also at the same elevation. Both are fishing villages and the socio-economic conditions are similar. During the 2004 tsunami there was no human casualty and there were no damage to property including houses in the T.S. Pettai village which were mango protected by the mangrove so to say. The sea water in intruded into only a small portion of land, whereas in Murukutturai, a village unprotected from the mangrove cover, 11 people died and 136 houses 
that is almost 88 percent were totally damaged due to forceful entry of seawater dr selvam adds quote on land mangroves non-mangrove forests such as dry deciduous coastal forests man-made plantations such as casuarinas and sand dune with vegetation act as bio shields against hydrometeorological disasters in the coastal waters coral reefs play a dominant role in mitigating the impact of the tsunami unquote this was something i learned firsthand substantiating the scientists research our villager village villagers that i spoke to for the book research and whom i met in coastal areas of tamil nadu they were affected by the asian tsunami obviously a quote there are mangrove forests at the shore though the tsunami waters touched our ts petai village the power of the waves were largely mitigated by the mangrove because as the waves came in they spared the village and the establishment of any damage our village remained intact says 40 year old chola rajan a fisher folk leader or a representative in ts petai village quote the speed of the tsunami waves was visibly reduced thanks to the presence of mangroves that protected us from the killer waves adds 35 year old arjun in ts petai village in chidambaram taluk of kadalor district in tamil nadu but arjun rules the loss of 50 goats in the tsunami a rare livestock casualty given that by and large animals sensed the tsunami coming and escaped to the hinterland but mangrove forests are largely found in a flat estuarine areas devoid of higher grounds like hills that explains why livestock were trapped by the tsunami waters adds 65 year old devendra for quote the first wave was small but the second wave was full of froth the third wave was very high and invaded dry land but surprisingly there was no damage to the village adds 41 year old ravi the tsunami rendered farmland saline in the long term overuse of bore wells and tube wells has exacerbated groundwater salinity in the indian andaman nicobar islands too lack of mangroves played a significant role in the decimation of the vulnerable fisher folk villages and population in the nicobar group of islands without mangroves the rather flat khar nicobar island was defenseless when the tsunami lashed land nicobar islands lie closer to the epicenter of the earthquakes and the tsunami waves the destruction of the mangroves in large larger areas of nicobar islands for construction of jetties piers etc account for the larger decimation of the nicobar islands as compared to the andaman islands the andaman islands lie north of the 10 degrees channel which were both farther away from the epicenter and were also significantly protected by mangroves the epicenter of the 9.3 megawatt mega moment magnitude 9.3 of the earthquake was 3 degrees 29.5 degrees north and 95.98 degrees 2 east longitude but 10 years after the tsunami when i visited many areas in nicobar islands i noted that no conscious effort is being made by the island administration for mangrove replantation and re forestation in any of the nicobar islands it was indeed telling of the and revealing of the corruption in the administration this despite the fact that the administration claims in a written response to an rti right to information application filed by me and they came up with a statement and i quote the department of environment and forests is implementing a scheme on mangroves namely conservation and development of mangrove and littoral forests under the sub sector forestry and wildlife under the union territory plan of scheme the allocated funds are funds under the 11th Five year plan for the forest divisions of South Andaman, Havelock, Barathang, Middle Andaman, Diglipur, and Nicobar group of islands is 123.98 lakh between 2007 and 2014, 15, 2014 and 15, and the expenditure incurred is 77.64 lakh. Uh, requests to the administration to facilitate a photo shoot by me of these mangroves were ignored. However, the Information and Publicity Department provided one photograph of mangrove plantation, which is published below in the in the book, and it's also so going to come up in this video section 38 of india's disaster management act 2005 states that the state must take responsibility for taking measures for prevention and mitigation of disasters ensuring appropriate preparedness measures for integrating disaster management also into development plans and projects allocation of funds for prevention mitigation preparedness for disasters and capacity building in state um corruption this is a box item i've written in the book which i'm going to read out now corruption is the middle name of the ani administration the andaman nicobar administration called referred to as ani administration does not often come under the scanner of the mainland press quite literally insulated by the ocean 
the corrupt elements in the administration tend to intimidate investigative reporters by non-cooperation and derision as happened to me. My very first letter requesting the administration for facilitation of research was ignored, derided and when I, I insisted on visiting as I have been commissioned to do this book and other segments of the multimedia tribute, I was to say the least treated with contempt. My requests were not so much as a red. I was asked to make six requisitions and not one was replied or responded to. I was asked, okay, on arrival in the islands, I figured instantly that funds for publicity have been misused most likely on alcohol. On coming back, I filed RTI or right to information public applications asking for accounts of information and publicity department. It was acknowledged and I was asked to file the amount for documentation. After I submitted the fees, I did not get any reply from the Information and Publicity Department. In my 23 years of experience as a journalist, which was 23 years of experience as a professional journalist in 2014, I have found that those who have nothing to hide are confident, positive and most willing to share the details being sought. But I found many officers not cooperating with me during my investigations in Andaman Nicobar Islands. The director of the Disaster Management Authority in fact asked me on phone a week before I arrived in Andaman as to what was my height and weight and if I would be wearing high heels and leather jacket. He also good naturedly told me something I thought about seriously later. How many people can you change Malini? He offered to come to the airport to receive me but after I went to ANI repeated phone calls to ask for an appointment were ignored. The deputy director of the disaster management authority bluntly told me I cannot give you any pictures what are you going to do? The commissioner for disaster management promised to meet me after I finished my trip to Nicobars, but on my return to Port Blair, she had gone on a fortnight's leave. During my last meeting with the former I IPT, that is Information, Publicity and Tourism Secretary, one Mr. R. Bali, he smiled at me very generously. I inquired what made him so amused. He told me just as frankly, I admit I am happy that you are leaving. Further, my RTI application seeking details of funds spent by the Information and Publicity Department went unanswered. Other applications that were directed by the Disaster Management Authority to the Department of Science and Technology to answer my query if there are sinkholes in Barren Island too were ignored. It's a volcanic area. There has to be sinkholes. The relief and <coughs> the relief and disaster management commissioner, an assistant commissioner of South Andaman district, replies to my RTI application with a gem. I got on the 21st of November 2014 from the AC's office in South Andaman district. My question was, are mock drills held all over Andaman Nicobar Islands or only in Port Blair? To this, the worthy by name A. Gupta, assistant commissioner R and D. M. in the office of DC, uh, that is the deputy commissioner, South Andaman district says, and I quote, RTI does not permit to answer any question. The act, however, does not require public information officer to deduce some conclusion from the material and supply the conclusion. So deduce to the applicant. It means that the public information officer is required to supply the material in the form held by the public authority, but not to do research on behalf of the citizen to deduce anything from the material and then supply it to him, unquote. Quote again, nature has provided biological mechanisms for protecting coastal communities from the fury of cyclones, coastal storms, tidal waves and tsunamis. Mangrove forests constitute one such mechanism for safeguarding concurrently the ecological security of the coastal areas and the livelihood security of fisher and farm families living in the coastal zone. This ecological, economic and social value will further increase if a rise in sea level takes place as a result of global warming and the meeting of glaciers and the Arctic and Antarctic ice cap. The recent tsunami of December 26, 2004 also highlighted the speed-breaking role of mangrove forests says the study toolkit for establishing coastal bioshields led by Dr. B. Selvam with co-authors Dr. T. Ravi Shankar, Dr. B. M. Karunakaran, Dr. R. Rama Subramaniam, Dr. P. Eganathan, A. K. Parida of M. S. Swaminathan Research Foundation in Chennai, India. Similarly, fisher folk in MGR Thittu in Kadalore district in Tamil Nadu had struggled for decades to establish a semblance of civilization on a thin sand strip facing the sea. They had managed to construct cement dwellings, albeit illegal and consequently without sanitation, after decades of toil. Defying caution, they had established dwellings in the foreshore area between the mangrove ecosystem and the sea on a thin sand strip. 
on the day of the tsunami i heard a huge roar like all other villagers we came out to see what the roar was all about it was shocking to see that the low tide had risen sky high within seconds it pulverized our village those who were out at sea fished fishing survived but those left on dry land died says 40 year old malai arasan in mgr titu's new settlement which has been constructed not abutting the sea rather a kilometer inside sorry inland after the tsunami the sand strip settle, settle is now abandoned mgr titu count accounted for 64 mortalities and 1300 injuries or affected people because of the tsunami the 2004 tsunami left horrific human tragedy but also some lessons it is the importance of coastal bio shields there were two types of coastal bio shields mangroves and non mangrove mangroves play very vital role in reducing the disaster effect a study by the scientists and engineers of different nations after the 2004 tsunami reveals that 300 trees per 100 square meters may reduce the maximum flow of a tsunami by more than 90% it is also observed that some of the non mangrove bio shields dies after the sea water spreads on the field whereas the mangrove bio shields is not affected by this effect says gladwin asier sustainable development activist in tuti cotton in tamil nadu field research and simulation simulation research indicates that 100 meters wide mangrove forest with 30 trees per 100 square meters will reduce the maximum tsunami flow pressure by more than 90% says dr selvam in an exclusive email interview given to me people are scared to live in the sand strip after the sand tsunami so they have been moved they have moved inland to kilai 33 year old nagamuthu of the irula tribe in mgr nagar shares with the with me in an exclusive discussion given to me on the 19th of february 2014 when i visited pichavaram in tamil nadu this is because seven people died in the kanagi nagar and pillu medu four shore villages on the sand strip between the mangrove forest and the sea near pichavaram nagamuthu adds not a soul died in the mangrove protected villages within pichavaram mangrove forest however seven people died in the kanagi nagar and the pillu medu villages on the four shore dwelling at a sand strip at the estuary between the mangroves and the sea at the mouth of the tributaries of kaveri river ramai a 48 year old fisher woman from mgr titu lost all her worldly possessions including the little proof of ownership of an encroached illegally constructed home to the killer wave she shudders to recall the black day we were so shocked that it took a whole year for us to restart fishing activities ramai says without property papers i could not get a compensatory home I am now homeless in the new settlement she moans the sand strip survived the tsunami and so have the concrete structures on the abandoned sand strip the thatched roof settlements built it in the waves extensive mangrove forests coral reefs sea grass beds sand dunes peatlands and other natural features served as barriers to wind and waves says alfredo quato talking about the significance of bio shields in protecting lives in the aftermath of the asian tsunami apart from the mangroves undersea coral reefs like the gulf like in the gulf of mana marine national park between tamil nadu in india in india and sri lanka in the fox strait such as were also spared the mighty wrath of the tsunami There was no tsunami inundation in the Gulf of Manar Marine National Park in extreme south southeast in extreme south eastern coast of Tamil Nadu. However, the Pox Straits and sea to the north of it was pummeled by the tsunami. This was partly because Sri Lanka took the brunt of the tsunami's force, covering the extreme southeastern coast of Tamil Nadu from the might of the tsunami. But more significantly, the coral reefs under sea, sea grass meadows absorbed the tumult of the waves swelling in the Pox Strait. These were there were no seismic or upwellings or tsunami in the Gulf of Manar Marine National Park, although the sea was restive, says local fisherman David in Ramesh. from the northern frontier of the gulf of manar marine national park forest officer dr shekhar kumar neeraj indian forest service officer former field director of the gulf of manar marine national park in the pox straits off the coast of tamil nadu tells me quote coral reefs and mangrove ecosystems help in mitigating hydrometeorological disasters because coral reefs absorb dynamic forces of the wind of tsunamis and cyclones like we experienced during the asian tsunami in december 2004 they channelize currents and reduce the velocity of the wave actions like a barrier they lie inside the sea 1 to 3 meters down from the surface and create belts along the coast <clears throat> the reefs are the long walls of corals and act in the same manner while covering a long length once the intensity of the wind is reduced the cyclonic wind loses its strength and the impact is much lesser the islands which have 
coral origin and constitution in the gulf of mena demonstrated least impact during the tsunami the reefs also change the course of tides regulate sea surface temperatures and thus prevent or regulate cyclone occurrences the gulf of mena marine national park characterized by an underwater reef effectively prevented damage from the tsunami while the absence of such reef north of rameshwaram saw widespread damage to the coastal entity nagapatnam was devastated by the tsunami indeed nagapatnam was pounded so hard that over 6000 people died within the span of 3 hours at the mercy of the waves pummeled by the tsunami actually within 15 minutes the challenge now is to work towards conditions that will lead to just and sustainable development a precondition for this would be to establish comprehensive and authenticated information on the situation and the needs of people in the affected area recognizing that better conservation policies would have significantly lowered the level of devastation and saved many lives there is as part of the recovery process the need to restore the natural barrier or green belt around the coastal areas that are are now vulnerable to future storms and tsunamis says authors Dr Lee Hong Jung Dr Mr Chan Beng Seng and Mr Rajan Solomon in the tsunami reader one the news of the december 26 tsunamis inundated are suddenly awakened essence says quarto two articles in interpress news service by me on the critical significance of the gulf of mana marine national park can be found on the two links that i will put up here as well as you can find it in the description box below mangroves were not the only mana from heaven in the asian tsunami during the Uttarakhand flash floods crisis in June 2013 too it emerged that the deliberate forest denudation on the Himalayan slope to make way for tourist related infrastructure development had caused soil instability accounting for flash floods the wrath of mother nature saw the humbling and crumbling of concrete edifices that dare that had dared nature's way Denudation and defined construction on fragile slopes pounded the construction into the course of flash flood this is a link to a video on the impact of the Uttarakhand flash floods by Messrs Wilderness Films of New Delhi the link is going to be put up here in Uttarakhand flash floods of June 2013 it was established beyond a doubt that the denuded deforested slopes clearly contributed to the simultaneous cloud burst a glacial burst flash floods sorry a glacial burst flash floods dam burst and landslide it led to the death of 6000 people at least from all over india and another 5000 people were missing at last count the government has not made a final announcement of death count in uttarakhand that climate change is being exacerbated by anth- anthropogenic factors is clearly established by the Uttarakhand disaster it is believed tsunami and its effects are part of a natural cycle given however the pace of climate change in our world and no serious political will to stem this climate change induced iceberg melt triggered tsunamis could become more frequent occurrences who will remind policy makers that both residents and visitors will not be safe until the business of making money fits well within the confines of effective and reasonable coastal coastal management plans that are designed to conserve and restore the natural green belts or buffers against future storm waves or winds are sure on that uh, on that same horizon as as quarto similarly mangroves are being denuded denuded in chuti cordon a low lying port area in extreme southeastern coast of tamil nadu to make way for salt pan development albeit it being a source of sustainable development offering food and livelihood security mangrove denudation is threatening the ecological security of low lying coastal areas that leaves the coastal dwelling populations more vulnerable to hydrometeorological disasters the december 2004 tsunami brought to the notice of the public scientists administrators and policy makers the role of mangroves along the coast in reducing the damage to life and property of coastal communities although tsunami is a rare occurrence the coastal areas of india are regularly under threat from various other natural hazards such as cyclones storms storm surges and flooding which cause heavy damage to property and human life the plantation or restoration of mangroves along the coastal track have minimized the disaster up to some level says gladwin asir a sustainable development activist in chuti koran tamil nadu making the first anniversary sorry marking the first anniversary of the asian tsunami the district collector of nagapatnam dr j radhakrishnan indian administrative service officer in tamil nadu the ground zero of the calamity said and i quote as india and the world recover from the catastrophic loss of humanity due to the tsunami on the 26th of december 2004 nagapatnam which was the worst affected district in india with 6065 confirmed deaths has witnessed non stop activity in the past one year during this period what stood out was the constant resolve shown by the people to learn from nature's lessons and the resilience of the people and the government to develop communities which are not only resilient but also which serve for, strive for a safe 
our world. Simultaneously, the focus has been on not only restoring what was lost, but also aiming to change lives for the better as the rehabilitation process moves forward. Unquote. In addition to mangroves, which can grow only in estuarine environment and intertidal ecosystems, there are many other tree species uh, which can constitute valuable components of coastal shelter belts. All such species confer in the short term local economic and ecological benefits and in the long term global environmental benefits through carbon sequestration. It is only calamities that open our eyes to the friend in need role that the mangrove species play. The December 26, 2004 tsunami has created a widespread interest in the restoration of degraded mangrove forests, promotion of joint mangrove management systems involving local communities, and in raising bio shields and shelter belts along the coastal zone. The MSS MSSRF study states further, the Andaman district was spared the onslaught of the tsunami thanks largely to the mangrove course, said Rana Matthew, former PRO of the UT administration of Andaman Nicobar Islands in a conversation with me. It is now believed by many experts studying the disaster that where mangroves, coral reefs and other natural barriers still stood, the resultant destructive force of the tsunami was much less and in these same protected areas many lives were spared says Quarto in Tsunami Reader 1. This was the case in many other areas in the countries affected by the Asian tsunami. A BBC report quoting an IUCN report mentions the mangrove saving the lives during the tsunami the link of which is going to be put up here as well as in the description box below. Healthy mangrove forests help save lives in the Asian tsunami disaster a new report has said. The World Conservation Union compared the death toll from two villages in Sri Lanka that were hit by the devastating giant waves. Two people died in the settlement with a dense mangrove and scrub forest, while up to 6,000 people died in the village without similar vegetation, says the report by BBC science and nature correspondent Mark Tyvok. In addition to human lives, homes were lost, educational and economic structures were destroyed, and 100% of the local fish ponds and mangrove forests were destroyed or heavily damaged. As <coughs> Pardon me. As a result, a large portion of the population lost their livelihoods and income. Evidence shows that the tsunami destroyed all ponds in Desa Lamga. However, the majority of these ponds have already been rebuilt or repaired by various parties. The reparation efforts were focused on physical reconstruction rather than fixing coastal ecosystem conditions. Consequently, some of the ponds that were repaired have not yet become as productive as they were before the tsunami. Apparently, ecosystem restoration is no less important than physical restoration. This conclusion is consistent with Fauci's Back to the Future concept in 2004 that there are three main restoration items needed, that is back to create healthy fisheries for the future, that is to the future. Ecosystem restoration should not only repair physical ponds but also coastal ecosystems, including an updated database predicting stock, SDI, boats, etc. Local and vertical or top-down restoration institutions repair communications between stakeholders, restore property rights and protect food security. Economic restoration refers to economic justice or economic ethics in the perception of fishing resources not only as merely an engine of growth but also from non-market aspect. Unquote. The study of the Indian Ocean Tsunami 2004, uh, Recovery in Banda Aceh, sponsored by the International Recovery Program and undertaken by the Tsunami and Disaster Mitigation Research Center of the Sia Kuala University, submitted in January 2012 in Banda Aceh, says, and I quote, critical mangrove functions also include nursery and feeding grounds for coastal and riverine fish and prawns. They also provide concurrent coastal or delta protection from surges and floods as well as filtering water before it reaches coral reef and other offshore systems. The region of northern Sumatra provided an important collection point for young prawns for sale to the aquaculture industry in other parts of the country, says the UNEP study substantiating the economic losses on account of loss of mangroves and littoral forests that had made way for unsustainable prawn, shrimp, culture and aquaculture. The coastal zone of the northern and western portions of Aceh include five of the ten main vegetation types found in the island of Sumatra, mangrove, peat swamp, lowland evergreen and lowland semi-evergreen forest type and forest restricted to limestone. Mangrove forests around Banda Aceh had predominantly been replaced by thambak or shrimp farms. The total thambak area estimated to be 36,000 hectares is likely to have been largely comprised of former mangrove sites. On the west coast, sandy 
sandy shores predominate and only patchy mangroves were found. In the year 2000, Wetlands International had estimated that there were 30,000 hectares of mangroves in good condition around Simulu Island. A further 286,000 hectares remained in fair condition and 25,000 hectares in poor condition. Critical mangrove functions include nursery and feeding grounds for coastal and riverine fish and prawns. Tsunami impacts varied according to the shape and slope of the ocean floor. The presence of absence of reefs manage mangroves and offshore forests, the orientation of the coast and the slope of the coastline, and underlying, underlying rock and soil type. Image analysis shows that some areas have been highly modif modified by the tsunami. Estuary and wetland areas have apparently been scoured out, scoured out and drainage patterns changed. Other areas appear to show evidence of subsidence or drainage changes leading to potential new wetland areas. For example, the west coast of Nias Island is estimated to have risen by 5 meters due to earthquake effect, yet suffered no direct tsunami damage with associated impact to be expected on coastal drainage patterns. Unquote. If despite land upheaval, mangroves in Nias Island have protected the island from the tsunami's effects, it speaks volumes for the significance of mangroves. Quote, the condition of natural resources before the tsunami was much better than after. For example, the mangrove ecosystem was in fair condition and covered a large area before the tsunami, but was completely destroyed after. 100% of the mangroves were lost, swept away by the tsunami. According to respondents from the community, small fish, shrimp crab scallop but are very but are very difficult to obtain now let me say that again according to respondents from the community small small fish shrimps crabs scallops and oysters were easily obtained when there was a mangrove forest before the tsunami but are very difficult to obtain now this is because mangrove forests function as a nursery feeding and spawning ground for various aquatic species such as fish shrimp and oysters according to dahuri et al uh, in in the 2001 publication several studies have shown that there is a positive relationship between mangrove ecosystems and fishing resources mangrove ecosystems contribute up to 27.21% of the pelagic fish production in Aceh province, according to Indira in 2007. F. F. Reisel 2005 states that mangroves ecosystems contribute 44.18% of the demersal fish production in Bengali's district in Riau, Indonesia. Paw and Chua in 1989 state that there is a positive connection between the size of mangrove areas and the catches of Penedia shrimp in the Philippines. Martu Subroto and Namin in 1977 found a positive connection between the annual catches of shrimp and the size of mangrove areas throughout Indonesia. Furthermore, this connection has a linear quality equal to y equals 0 0.06 plus 0 0.15x where y is the result of shrimp captured per ton per year and x is the area of mangrove forest per hectare. Sudar Mono in 2005 found that around 30% of sea fishing production depends on the existence of mangrove forests because mangrove forests are a breeding place for sea species including several kinds of fish, says the IRP study in Sri Lanka. In Sri Lanka, too, a UNEP report called After the Tsunami Rapid Environmental Assessment established that more than 1,000 square kilometers had been inundated or severely damaged by the tsunami. Maps indicate that these were areas, sorry, that these areas were largely devoid or deprived of mangrove ecosystem. Retake maps indicate that these areas were large, largely devoid or deprived of mangrove ecosystem. At Yala and Bundala National Parks, vegetated coastal sand dunes completely stopped the tsunami, <coughs> which was only able to enter where the dune line was broken by river outlet. At one outlet in Yala National Park, considerable damage was done to park facilities with a number of human deaths, as well as to forest and grassland with many trees uprooted and the vegetation largely dead and brown. Less than 1% of the park area was affected by the tsunami in total. Unquote. Quote again, the preliminary environmental assessment has shown extensive but uneven damage to the natural resources that acted as the first line of defense from the tsunami such as coral reefs, mangroves, sand dunes and other coastal ecosystems. Anecdotal evidence and satellite photography before and after the tsunami event seem to corroborate claims that coral reefs, mangrove forests and other coastal vegetation as well as sea worms provided protection from the impacts of the tsunami. <clears throat> the damage to coastal ecosystems is highly variable and the damage to coral reef is mostly due to the impact of debris from the land. Coastlines have been eroded with much of the sediment deposited on healthy reef, agricultural land, in rivers,
rivers or even creating new islands. Shallow soils were stripped from low-lying atolls. Sri Lanka offers some of the best evidence that intact coastal ecosystems such as coral reefs and healthy sand dunes helped buffer aggressive waves. For example, most of Yala and Bundala National Parks were spared because vegetated coastal sand dunes completely stopped the tsunami, which was the only able to enter where the dune line was broken by river outlet. Some of the severest damage to Sri Lanka's coast was where mining and damage of coral reefs had been heavy in the past. Similar observations were found in the province of Phang Na in Thailand, where mangrove forests and sea grass beds significantly significantly mitigated the effect of tsunami. In Sri Lanka, the receding waters of the tsunami after the first, second and the third waves carried enormous debris from land and deposited these including rock and boulders on the seabed and highlighting seagrass meadows and submarine or coral ecosystems. Priority should be given to near shore eco forest development as trees will help absorb the future energy of future tsunamis, prevent coastal erosion due to rising sea levels and meet national objectives for reforestation and job creation. A key feature of the rehabilitation and reconstruction must be to ensure the sustained livelihoods of the people in the areas affected by the disaster and to empower civil society to engage in and respond to rehabilitation and reconstruction, says the UNEP study post tsunami. Clearly advocating bio shields or green defenses in the UNEP study, uh, major projects are needed in all affected countries to restore ecosystem goods and services, for example, by planting coastal green, ben green belt forests, reconstructing sand dunes or installing other soft devices. International support will likely be needed. Capacity building in techniques for rapid rehabilitation of natural areas is urgently needed. Rehabilitation should use indigenous species rather than risk the negative impacts that could result from the use of alien species. The need for increased attention to hard structures such as emergency centers or sea walls also requires further study. If disaster mitigation is all about lessening the impact of calamities, then livelihood options are integral to disaster risk reduction. It is towards this end that sustainable solutions must be given or driven. Long Long-term information empowerment, RTI, multiple livelihoods, bio-villages, models of coastal zone rehabilitation are measures undertaken by the MS Faminathan Research Foundation for long-term disaster mitigation for fisher folk after the tsunami, said Dr. MS Faminathan himself in an exclusive discussion with me on the 18th of February 2014 at Chennai. Talking happily about the economic benefits that fisher folk have accrued from reforesting mangroves in the rec recommended fish bone structure or layout, Naga Muttu in MGR Nagar told me in a discussion that the tsunami turned out to be a watershed, an opportunity for scheduled tribes like the Irulas, the indigenous people native to Tamil Nadu, to become mainstreamed. To give an in-depth first-person account, I have copied here under the interview transcripts of my interviews in MGR Titu and MGR Nagar in Kadalore district of Tamil Nadu. Box item, interview transcripts of MGR Nagar near Pichavaram Mangroves, Kadalore district on 19th of February 2014. MGR Nagar was established by Dr. G. S. Bedi, Indian Administrative Service Officer, Collector of Kadalore after the tsunami. It was meant to be a resettlement colony for Irula tribes of Tamil Nadu who were not included in the scheduled tribe category till 2004. With one administrative stroke, Irulas were notified as scheduled tribe. They were included in development schemes and legal or constitutional framework. Till the tsunami happened, these Irulas were hunter-gatherers and were working as bonded agricultural laborers under extremely exploitative conditions. They did suffer at the time of the tsunami. Seven people died in their villages on the sandbars at the foreshore. These villages were in between the Pichavaram mangroves and the sea. The mangroves largely protected their habitations, unlike the foreshore settlements in Kannagi. Nagar and Pillu Medu villages on the sand bar near the estuary or the mouth. These two villages were located on the sand strip between the mangroves and the sea and were smashed hard. In another nearby sand bar, the MGR Titu, 64 people died. MGR Titu was also located on a sand strip between mangrove forests and the sea. The tsunami water was cold, survivors say, and the second and the third waves, terrorizing waves, were at least 5 to 10 meters in height. G.S. Bedi, Indian Administrative Service Officer, Collector of Kadalore District at the time 
time of the tsunami notified them as tsunami beneficiaries gave them pakka cement concrete houses with sanitation and secure livelihood support after the tsunami these irulas were earlier hunter gatherers who have become new fishers and fished for their livelihood mgr nagar now has a school a primary healthcare center and the school which was funded and supported by mssrf for a initial 3 years after the tsunami has now grown in strength and is about to become a high school the construction of the new building was going on at the time of research visit by me on the 19th of february 2014 the first generation learners have completed high school at the nearby high school because the one at mgr nagar did not have high school they have gone on to become university students pichakanna a 55 year old tribal at the mgr nagar says the anthropological studies were conducted and it was established that they were indeed of irula tribal origin and it helped in including them in the sc scheduled tribe list nagamuttu 33 years old in 2014 says if they had not been included in the scheduled tribe list they would never have developed or benefited from the government schemes it all happened thanks to the initiative of ias officer dr gs bedi we would have remained hunter gatherers eating rats and hunting snakes we have benefited from the government schemes like forest rights act we developed mangrove plantation on forest land granted to us and the forest rights act has also given us fishing rights in a protected area like the pichavaram mangrove so we now protect the mangroves in return another fallout is the awareness about alcoholism before we were included in, the, in government beneficiary schemes almost all the fishing income was spent on alcohol now we hardly find anyone an alcoholic all the development has been channelized through the development fund under the guidance of the village knowledge center established by ms swaminathan research foundation on the link given below you will find a slide show by me published in the ips news service it captures the essence of mangroves for sustainable development of a marginalized vulnerable community the irulas here's another link uh, of an article by me these two links will also be put up in the description box below these villagers have been engaged by ms swaminathan research foundation in sustainable traditional fisheries which was a whole new vocation for them we have also taken up mangrove plant plantation it has helped in reducing soil salinity has increased fish catch and since it was taken up in the conservation friendly fish bone structure it brought the creeks closer home for example it has reduced our fishing labor and helps in sustainable fisheries based livelihood after this success story the irula tribes who were earlier hunter gatherers have successfully transformed to become fisher folk now about 270 children are attending schools and there is a dire need for high school for a high school for the younger generation of fishers children there they are ms swaminathan research foundation's interventions taught them fish bone patterns of mangrove plantation it has decreased soil salinity prevented degradation of mangrove improved fish yield they have learned skills like crab patterning and crab trapping oyster harvesting increased fish yield and income and thus their standard of living has increased before the ms swaminathan research foundation's intervention they fished with hand picking though it was sustainable and not eco detrimental the yield was not sustainable fiscally after the ms swaminathan research foundation's intervention they created mangrove plantations and with the increase in fishing fishing catch and fishing incomes thus livelihoods the villagers have created a community fund comprising of 30% of every family's monthly income with which they now have constructed a village temple school drinking water facilities for all fisher folk villages after the tsunami devastation every fishing family got boats oars engines nets etc apart from fishing boats we now have gear hook trap also traps etc the security in fishing village livelihoods has spared us the food insecurity we faced as hunter gatherers with the community the fund we have also established an early warning helpline it includes voice sms intimation to fisher folk about wave height course currents wind wind direction fish catch and yield weather forecast for every 6 hours and government teams there is also a voice sms broadcast aimed at fisher women about health and hygiene maternity be- benefits and early warning during cyclones fisher folk are used to submergence in the waters for a few minutes to catch fish by hand but there was not a chance for those who died in the tsunami three women from one family died in the village of Kannagi Nagar itself says Nagamuttu in MGR Nagar Ramai a 48 year old woman survivor in MGR T two shudders to think of the tsunami says she the tsunami was like the manifestation of the lord of death 
Yama himself. Women got their hair caught in the fibers of the acacia tree, Veli Khatan, that is Prosopsis jujiflora, juju says Malai Arasan in MGR Titu a dry deciduous hardwood shrub forest species. Before the tsunami, only some privileged politically connected fishers had boats, craft and gear. But after the tsunami, the government gave all the survivors boats, craft and gear. Result is the cash per family has decreased, says a smiling but somewhat cynical L. Nagamuttu in MGR Nagar, ridiculing the aid effort. However, with the MS Swaminathan Research Foundation interventions, which taught us different methods of sustainable fisheries, like tidal fit cultivation, is not is natural eco-friendly means of fishing. It depends on intertidal ecosystem and thus is utterly sustainable. We have learned cultivation of saline resistant cultivation of greens for consumption. About 10 families undertake intertidal captive pond fishing. Another three families are involved in crab fattening. It has led to the community's livelihood security. In MGR Titu, new settlement constructed after the tsunami for relocation 1.5 kilometers away from the sea or the sandbar 40-year-old Malai Arasan says on the day of the tsunami, he was at home when he heard a deafening roar and ran out to see why it was the sea roaring. It was a huge wave of about 8 to 10 meters menacingly moving towards land. It was like the low tide had become very sky high. The wave started invading land and our thin sandbar was pummeled by the wave. Those who were out fishing were saved but those who remained on land suffered severe injuries and mortalities because they were washed away. I myself lost three children. Women were caught up with their hair entangled in the jujiflora trees that were uprooted by the tsunami waves. Apart from the 64 deceased in our village, many were severely injured. People entangled in the jujiflora trees but survived suffered severe injuries. People entangled in the flora trees but survived severe suffered severe injuries many drank the tsunami water and yes they suffered lung infection two pregnant women were severely injured our village's main livelihood was fishing and with the loss of craft and gear oars and engines we suffered immensely we had nothing no clothes no gear no utensils no food we had to make do with what we were given by the state says sudhakar a semi-skilled mechanic in mgr titu who speaks a spattering of english thanks to his experience as a merchant navy crew member in Singapore. We lost not just craft and gear and livelihoods but we literally had nothing left and with that we complete the first part of the, this chapter on uh, bio shields for disaster mitigation. The, there will be no live interaction tomorrow but the, because this at the end of this chap chapter's reading next week there will be a live interaction. Until then take care, keep smiling, stay safe and stay home. Ciao!